Friends, one of the cult, one of the many culture shocks I had before or after when I was studying about the United States and after I came was that one had to make a make an appointment in order to visit an American family. I know it's normal for you, but for me, coming from a different culture, that was certainly a culture shock because for me. Now we, everybody has phone, so we could call and say, hey, I'm coming, you know, just this evening or, you know, in a few, couple hours, then people would welcome. Not that you're not hospitable, it's just the difference of culture, and that's why it is a culture shock. It was, not anymore, I know why you do it. So that was something that I thought about as a culture shock. Today's scriptures talk about hospitality. Both Martha and Abraham are hospitable people. They welcome their guests and they do what hosts do. They feed them, they make them feel comfortable, they serve them drinks, and they have a good time. And over and above, Abraham receives a blessing. Martha receives an admonition for what her emphasis is, and we'll get to that. Martha receives Jesus in a home, virtue of hospitality to a visitor, family, friend, is very valuable. One of the important things about hospitality is, as I said, we treat our guests with great love, we treat our guests with great honor, and we do our best to make our guests feel comfortable and happy. That's what Martha was trying to do. But as Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and listened to him, she reminds us of a relationship that a teacher has with the student, that a disciple has with the master in the Old Testament, and even in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul talks about it. In Acts 22, he says, I sat as a student before Gamaliel, who was his teacher and master and rabbi. And that's what Mary does. She sits at the feet of the master, wanting to learn from him, listen to him, and follow his teachings. So what's the difference? Martha and Mary, they are both symbols of the aspects of spiritual, two aspects of spiritual life, of activity and of contemplation. It is a very ancient interpretation of this passage going back to Origen, a third century scripture scholar who was a prolific commentator on especially the Gospel of Luke. There is a little more going on there, so that's what we're going to pay our attention to. Scripture says Martha was distracted. What distraction means is you are pulled away from something that you're doing. You know, recently a friend of mine said when he was at a stoplight in California and tried to reach out to his phone, the cop saw him, pulled him aside and gave him a ticket. And he was very upset. He was really very upset. He says, I'm at the intersection. I said, I'm not going into the law of it, but were you distracted when you reached out to the phone? You know, that's what the law says, because it will pull you away from paying attention to what you're supposed to do, drive, keep yourself safe, and keep others safe, right? So distraction pulls us away from what we are supposed to be focusing ourselves on. And that is what both Luke and Jesus points out about Martha, that she's distracted, that she's anxious and worried and fretful about many things. That's what the scripture says about her. She's distracted with her serving and she's anxious about earthly things. The service that Martha is providing leads her to distraction and anxiety. 
Well, that is why Jesus calls her attention. She is a very hospitable woman who wants to treat her guest, you know, royally. But Jesus says, Mary has chosen a good portion, a better part. And it will not be taken from her. Now, Jesus is a guest at Martha's house, yet he's not shy speaking the truth. And Martha is not shy going to Jesus and asking him to help, to intercede in the sibling rivalry here. And Jesus says what is true. He says in Martha's prayer, Jesus gives her a different dimension. He leads her on the right path. That's what happens when we come to God in prayer. Even though Martha was complaining, it may not be seen as prayer, yet Jesus directs her on a right path and says, what your sister has chosen is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And it will not be taken from her. So coming to origin, this third century scripture scholar, commentator, he says this about contemplation and action. There is no contemplation without action. There is no action without contemplation. So it's not either or, it's both. You have to sit down before your master, you have to learn from your teacher, and then you've got to go out and do what your teacher asks you to do. So, both are essential to be animated to the love of God and to the love of neighbor. Both are needed to be animated toward the love of God and love of neighbor. It is a fundamental virtue to be hospitable, but the activity and service can easily pull us away from God. And that's what distraction does, pull us away from God. It can easily become, guess what? An excuse, right? Reason not to engage in prayer, reason not to engage in contemplation. I love to pray, but I'm so busy. I have only this many hours, 24 hours, and I've got so much to do. That's what Jesus says. In other words, that's the distraction. With earthly things, whether we pay bills or do chores in family, or work, or school, all those are good things. All those are right things to do. But can we strike a balance? Can we start with prayer and move further on with the activity that we are called to do by our responsibility? Jesus doesn't ask us to neglect one and do the other. Both are equally important. But it has to start with contemplation. And so that's a legit, legitimate concern of life to become, to, be dis, to become a distraction away from contemplation. In other words, one thing that is necessary is prayer and discipleship. Prayer and discipleship go together. When that becomes priority, guess what happens? All things are ordered to Christ through contemplation. Isn't Christ the master and the focus, the center of our lives, prayer and contemplation then becomes the source of strength that is necessary to be engaged in service of our neighbor. And duties that you are called to do in our daily lives, chores and other responsibilities. So I don't know about you, but so often it is a big struggle for me there are so many things I've got to do, so often engaged in over-activism that leads me to neglect sitting before Jesus, that need, makes me neglect at times the liturgy of the hours where I'm called to do, that I promise to do. Learning from my master becomes difficult because pulled in every direction and my humanity sets into, and then there is excuse, right? There is reason you want to 
reason it out and find an excuse saying, yeah, I'm too tired, I don't have to pray now, right? I've done the work of God, right? I've visited the sick, done this, that, blah, blah. But Jesus says, no. Sitting before me will lead you to do those other things in much better and greater way. That's the difference. That's the difference. I was reading Psalm 15, which we read today, and verse 1, which isn't part of today's responsorial psalm, starts this way, O Lord, who shall sojourn in thy tent? Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? This is, this is inverting hospitality. Here, the psalmist is asking, how will I get to receive your hospitality, Lord? How will I get to receive your hospitality in your temple, in your tent? By walking blamelessly, the scripture says, by doing what is right, the scripture says, will enable me to embrace God's hospitality. God will welcome us into his house forever and ever. So, how much time can I spend sitting before my guru, my teacher, my master, learning, spending time, listening, reading scriptures, studying the sacred scripture, teaching our faith to our children? This is one thing necessary, Jesus says, and will not be taken away from any of us. This is the better portion of our life, and we cannot neglect it. This will, in fact, lead us into the tent of God, into the house of God, into the joys of everlasting life. And isn't that our purpose? Isn't that our goal? All what we fret about, isn't that ultimately what we are looking forward to? So let's focus our attention on what Jesus says are distractions and get away from them. And what Jesus says is critical for our spiritual life and for our holistic well-being, the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit.